Now to the Williams Tractor Hotline, and we will uh, visit with uh, Mike Irwin, the Dean of uh, Reporters covering Razorback Sports. He's with the Pig Trail Nation, and he joins us now. Uh, Mike, thanks for the time this afternoon. Uh, glad to be here, guys. So one of the things, that when we start to think about Eddie Sutton, could you paint a picture for us of like Barnhill Arena circa 1974 and just kind of how dilapidated a facility it was then? Well, 75 was my first year, but it still wasn't renovated. And Eddie was here. But I'd sit in there and watch practice, and it'd be in the afternoon, and they had all these tiny windows across the top of that building, which was basically a big, giant metal building. And the sun would come shining through those windows, and there was a, the, from the about where the court ended on the south side all the way over to what's now the end of the building, that was all dirt. And there was just nasty dirt flying in the air. You could see all that dust. And you, I remember thinking, man, I, I can't stay in here very long. I'd probably come out of here with some kind of lung disease. So it was a really depressing place. It was, you know, even that year they had it full, but it only held about 4,000. And the transformation that took place was just amazing. I mean, they took what I thought. I thought there's no way to make this a decent place to play basketball. And the architects really did a good job. And, they did it in two phases, but by that second year that when it was fully renovated, I mean, it just took off. I mean, I've never seen a place like that. I mean, he won 94% of his games in that building. That's, like, insane. Who does that? That means that you have, like, almost no chance of winning ever when you come in to play Arkansas. So it, he, he really made that building. I'm, I'm sitting in a crate in five or four that when Eddie Sutton shows up at the University of Arkansas, it, it barely makes a ripple. People are kind of throwing up their hands saying, who is Eddie Sutton? Yeah, that's kind of an interesting story because Frank was in his first year as AD, and everybody always says this stuff about Frank was afraid that people would surpass his legacy or whatever. It was nonsense. He really wanted a better athletic department overall. And at that point, Arkansas had never generated revenue in anything but football. And he had talked to some other ADs that said, hey, basketball is getting to be a big thing. You could get it. In those days, you got to keep your NCAA money. You didn't have to share it with other teams in the conference. The teams that went got the money. And so if you could get a big fan base and had a nice arena, you could really generate some money out of basketball. And he hired Eddie Sutton under that idea. He said, look, I'll bring you in here, but you got to put butts in those seats. you got to fill it up you got to get us into the tournament. We need to make some money out of this program. And Eddie was all over it. And I think that's one of the reasons he hired him, because he was so enthusiastic about making that happen. And he had to go around to all these Razorback clubs and talk to them and get them fired up, and they weren't very fired up in the beginning. But Eddie was a salesman. And then it helped that he got Brewer, Moncrief, and Delft right off the bat. That, that sort of made that thing work. I still remember a game against Southwest Missouri and. It was 1975 in December, and each one of those guys played well in that game, and people just went nuts because they were all three from Arkansas, and you just liked them. You liked the, the differences. I mean, Moncrief was intense. Brewer was kind of smooth and silky, and Delph just he just shoot the ball. You, you always had the impression he could just turn his head away from the basket and still make a 40-foot shot. So they, the, the, the three of them just really helped make that thing work. But it really was all about Frank wanted to use the money from basketball to improve other facilities, and that's exactly what happened. They built that indoor track and, and tennis center, and then they put a, a artificial surface over George Cole Field, which was unheard of in any place but Texas. They built some stands and an actual press box, and uh, they just they, the hyper building was built, but Frank had the money to lease the pool. And Arkansas had this really nice pool for their swimming team. So within just a couple of three years, Frank totally upgraded the athletic facilities for all the other sports, which eventually led to women's sports becoming a much bigger deal. But that all started with money that Eddie helped generate. We're talking with Mike Irwin here on Ruskin and Zach. Uh, fair to say that um, Eddie Sutton taught a generation of Razorback fans not only the game of basketball, but to love the game of basketball? Well, he was, when he got here, and you got to remember, I'd never, the only other coaches I'd been around on a college level was an NAI school in East Texas, and it was a terrible situation. They didn't, 
they didn't talk much and you didn't they don't let you talk to your their athletes you didn't go to practice so i get here and i can't believe it i mean he just got his door open you could just walk into his office you could watch all of his practice and he was always talking about educating the fans i had a wireless mic on him one day in practice because he wanted to do me to do a feature on how he was going to coach defense because he wanted the fans to understand that and there was a point where he left and went upstairs and I took the headsets off, but then he didn't come back, so I put them back on. And he was on the phone with uh, Bobby Knight, and they were just going nuts about the fact that fans just wanted offense. That's all they wanted. And it was hard to coach players to play defense when they'd come out of high school just wanting to shoot jump shots. And Bobby was like, you know, his his way of doing it was just to kick them in the butt. <laughs> but but Eddie was saying, we've got to educate the fans. we got to make them understand that a 58-54 game is okay if you win and he spent the whole time he was here educating the fans. And then the thing that happened was when they got in the stands, they understood his system and honestly it made them better fans. It made the, the atmosphere better. What do you make of when you hear guys like Joe Klein or Scott Hastings or Ron Brewer talk about their admiration for him, not as a basketball coach, but as, as, as sort of a pseudo father figure to these guys. Well, because he he really was more than just basketball. He wasn't one of these guys who was just totally obsessed. He had a great sense of humor. He was fun to talk to, but he also had their back in situations. I, I everybody remembers U.S. Reed shot against Louisville, but what they don't remember is when they got up to Indiana State and Reed got double screwed. He he was tripped, and then they called traveling on him when he didn't travel, and that really decided the game. And you guys talk about how Eddie was, you know, in that locker room saying, man, you don't have anything to hang your head over. That was not you. That was a referee. And and then Joe talking about the way he, Eddie stepped in after his own dad died and, and kind of became a, a, you know, a father figure to him. He, he was just like that. He was totally devoted to his wife uh, right up until she died. And uh, he was just a great guy. And let me just tell you guys, the biggest issue we all have in this business is coaches who, who just are hypersensitive about being criticized. I can't stand that when that happens. And you'd think they'd know going in it was part of the job. But, Eddie, I remember one time I wrote something negative about him or put it on the air, and I knew he'd be mad or figured he would be. And I came over to Barnhill all expecting him to jump all over me, and he was just laughing about it. And he finally came up to me. And he finally said toward the end of that conversation, he said, yeah, he says, you're okay. He says, that was a good piece. He always called anything you did on TV a piece. That was a good piece. But he said, I just want you to know you're in real trouble with the student newspaper. Those guys hate you. <laughs> He's laughing, you know, it was a joke. Like, oh, boy, those guys are going to get me. But he just, that's the way he handles situations like that. We're talking with Mike Irwin here on um, uh, Ruskin and Zach. Uh, Mike with the uh, Pig Trail Nation. Um the end of Arkansas, I, I've read something over the weekend where that's one of his biggest regrets is how he handled the end at Arkansas and going to uh, Kentucky. Yeah, he, he had a drinking problem, and it really surfaced the last couple of years, and he was bizarre to be around. The change was unbelievable. He he said things at press conferences that didn't make any sense. You know, Bob Holt, he'd always come back after him, and he just said this, and, you know, and you know, Eddie would kind of try to blow it off. I remember one day... He basically, in a press conference, implied that college basketball reps were tied into Vegas and were throwing games to make money in Vegas, which was an outrageous claim. But then when Bob pressed him on it, he just kind of backed off. But he, it was just a very strange period. And I personally believe that he would have been fired eventually because he didn't. We, Frank wanted him to go get treatment, and he didn't want to do it. And before any of that could come to a head, Kentucky hired him, and then we know what happened at Kentucky. But I also have tremendous uh, empathy for Eddie Sutton because I've known alcoholics. And I'm telling you, they've got some kind of a gene or something in them that makes them different from other people. He tried and tried and tried to, to, to break that habit. He rehabbed a couple of times, and it just keeps coming back. And it's just so hard to deal with. And I think he always regretted that part of it. But you can't live your life that way. You know, you have to – he did come back from that whole Kentucky thing and, and fashioned a second career for himself at his alma mater, and he was very well loved over there, the way he handled that plane crash that he handled there and brought their program back. 
and uh, caused that arena to be, uh, uh, you know, renovated to what it is today. Um, he was a tremendously positive influence on college basketball. Uh, you mentioned the Oklahoma State. I, I was talking to some uh, some writers over in Oklahoma State uh, yesterday, and it, it seems that his legacy, you know, at least amongst you know, it, when they write the Eddie Sutton story, is going to be tied to that Oklahoma State job. That's what everybody kind of remembers him for. Um, the Kentucky sure. thing is sort of a side note, but people forget the great job he did at Arkansas. Talk to me a little bit about that Oklahoma State program that he took over and took uh, teams that were quite quite honestly not that talented to Final Fours. Well, he did the same thing there that he did here. He just, because of him, it became a huge spectator sport, and that's why they had to renovate the place. And he filled it up, and he got on TV. One of his greatest strengths was being on television, because keep in mind, guys, especially in those days, when a game was over, especially in the NCAA tournament, you'd always have some guy like Billy Packer or earlier Al McGuire. They'd bring you over and talk to you, and he was so good in situations like that. But he would also zing those guys. And that's why Arkansas fans liked him, because there was a perception in those days, wow, you pulled off this big upset. You beat whoever. And Eddie was kind of like zing them, like, you don't know what you're talking about. This is not an upset. And so the fans loved him for that. And then for the same reason, they loved him at Oklahoma State, with the difference being he was one of them. Mm -hmm. You know, he was an alum. And I think that he was really, really happy there able to come back and kind of give something back to that school where he played basketball. And he was, he was a, when, as a player, he really was hard on Arkansas. I don't, I, I think he, you didn't want to play against him. He was a good, good college player. Well, as a, a player and a coach, he went seven and zero against uh, Arkansas. I saw uh, yeah. Hogstats uh, tweeting about that uh, earlier uh, on the weekend. We're talking with Mike Irwin here on Ruskin and Zach. Uh, another uh, famous day that, um, Eddie Sutton was uh, presiding over, and one of those interviews you talked about was the day that uh, he was talking to Al McGuire after Arkansas upset North Carolina in Pine Bluff. This, the Obviously, television had a large role in it, but they, didn't they play the day before? There's a lot of weird circumstance around that 84 North Carolina game in Pine Bluff. Yeah, they played SMU, and they had to fly in on the plane, and it was a, one of those dinky planes they fly on in those days, and it was, I think it was a prop plane, and it was going all over the place. The players were kind of queasy, and they got to the motel or hotel, wherever they were, and they had to hurry and go over and, and warm up. And it, I think, honestly, because he didn't have time to really totally prepare them for that game, they probably didn't fully understand who they were about to play. And sometimes that helped. But it's a testament to his coaching ability, because you talk about a team that was loaded. I mean, North Carolina was number one, but they had all these great players. And Arkansas just kind of tag team Michael Jordan. He had a great day, but Arkansas had several players in that 10, 8, 10, 12 point range. Joe, I think, had 16 or 17 or whatever. But Charles Ballantyne was just Mr. Cool there at the end, and he made the shot. And uh, that's something nobody will ever forget. You know, it was just a, one of those Razorback history things. And Joe always, I think he said on that Michael Jordan. Thing, last dance or whatever that was. I didn't watch much of it, but he said something about he reminded <laughs> reminded Michael Jordan of that any chance he got. You know, just want you to remember we beat your butt. <laughs> what is his place in Arkansas athletics history? I know it kind of gets marred by the way that he left, but I'm, I mean, there's Broyles, there's Nolan, there's McDonald. Where's his sort of peg in that uh, in that hierarchy? I think because of he left and because of what happened, he's just kind of a little rung below Nolan. He didn't win a national championship, and he did leave, but he still, you know, they still remember him. They still love him. They love him for Sydney and all those, U.S. Reed and all those guys, Scott Hastings. And probably the best way I can describe it is Eddie Sutton, or Nolan Richardson's name is on that court. But Eddie's name is over on the practice facility, and that's kind of the next best thing. It's just right a step below Nolan. And Nolan, you know, he's revered, national championship and all that. So he's right in there with all of them, but maybe just slightly below Nolan. And, of course, he has his name on the court over in uh, Stillwater at uh, Gallagher Iba Arena. Absolutely. Mike Irwin, uh, Pig Trail Nation, thank you so much, Mike, for the uh, for remembering today. We appreciate it. See you guys. All right, Mike and all our guests join us here on the Williams Tractor Hotline on Ruskin and Zach.